Father in heaven, we thank you for blessing us to be able to come here and worship you in spirit and in truth this morning. We thank you for the uh, blessings that you have bestowed on us. Thank you for watching out for us, for protecting, for, for providing this week. And no matter what we've been through, we're very grateful that you have uh, led us through, that you've given us your spirit, that you've encouraged us, you've given us hope. And we love you and appreciate you for all of your wonderful gifts. And Father, this is your time to speak to our hearts. It's your opportunity to, uh, to just grab our attention, to convict us, to transform us, to change us, to open up our eyes and help us to see what is happening in our world and ultimately, though, what your uh, desire and your will is for our lives. So Father, I just pray as I humble myself before you that you would use me to speak your word with power, with clarity, that it will be very understandable even to our young people. I pray, Lord God, that you would take full control and that we will know we've had a supernatural, uh, just God-centered experience this morning. And so I give you permission to use me, Lord God, and just speak so that we can hear your voice. And we thank you, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of Acts, and we will be in Acts chapter 13. Acts 13, and when you get there, you can let me know by saying amen. Acts 13. And as we're traveling through this section of the book of Acts, again, we see that the church is is growing. It's expanding into new areas. It's not just reaching Jews anymore. The gospel is now reaching into darker areas. We saw previously in a few chapters before uh, Gentiles who were coming to Christ and also the, the church's struggle with accepting uh, folks into the church that were not Jews, not knowing exactly uh, what is required of them. And we're actually going to see in a few chapters uh, later uh, the battle that the church had with people coming into the church that weren't used to worshiping as the Jews did. But here we see in the beginning of Acts 13, and I won't read all of these verses, but uh, here we see that Barnabas and Paul especially are being set aside for the work that they, are being, that they have been called to do by the Lord. They are ordained by God to begin their work reaching the Gentiles. And those first four verses especially talk about the ordination that they experienced, that God sent them away. And we really kind of join the story I want to get to right here in verse 6 on their journey. This is their first missionary journey. And verse 6 says, And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so was his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O oh, full of all subtlety and all mischief, you child of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind, not seeing the sun for a season." And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So a very interesting story. Again, we see Christianity expanding and growing, and as Barnabas and Paul are beginning their first missionary journey, they you know, end up on this island, and here's this very prudent, this very wise and intelligent uh, deputy or proconsul by the name of Sergius Paulus. And we can kind of glean from the text that this man was, besides the fact that he was intelligent and wise, that he was hungering for something. Obviously, he was hungry for something spiritual, which is very interesting because, you know, if you look at some of the Roman rulers and leaders that show up in the book of Acts and also in the Gospels, there's not a whole lot of these men that really are hungry for spiritual things. Even the fact that he had this sorcerer next to him, who obviously was giving him counsel or giving him some information. He was a Jew, but he was a sorcerer. He practiced, you know, what we would call in modern times magic. 
There might have been some sleight of hand trickery, some miracles, but obviously this was an individual that was filled with, or at least working with, demonic spirits. Now, the proconsul or the deputy really couldn't discern that. He was just seeking for something deeper, something more in his life. But when he heard about Paul and Barnabas and the gospel that they were preaching, what did he do? His reading and comprehension. What did he do? You guys are quiet. It's open book test, too. It's right there in the text. <laughs> what did he do? Good, thank you. He desired to hear the word of God. So he said, okay, I have this spiritualist that he doesn't really know what this guy is teaching, whether it's true or whether it's false. This guy is just hungry for something deeper, something more. So now he hears about Paul and Barnabas and the teaching of Christianity, and he says, I want to hear what they have to say. And he invites Paul and Barnabas to come and speak to him and teach him about Christianity and the gospel. Don't you wish that helping people know the Lord was that easy? That people would just track you down and say, hey, look, I need to know about Christianity. I need to know about your Seventh-day Adventist background. Will you just come to my house and teach me? And you just go there and you teach them the word of God and they get converted on the spot. There are instances like that. As a matter of fact, when I worked in San Francisco, I, you know, we were getting ready for a large evangelistic meeting and we were doing Bible studies with people who had sent in some cards to get information. And we walked up to this guy's house. His name was Paul Detweiler. And I walked, into, walked up to his house with another Bible worker and we knocked on the door, asked him if he wanted to study the Bible. He says, sure, come on in, let's study right now. Studied the Bible with him. The guy accepted everything, came to the meetings. It was just as easy. We baptized him, and he's still in that church today. I see him every year at camp meeting. But that's not always the case. But this man came looking for the gospel, hungering for it, thirsting for it. And he's getting this, this Bible study, if you will, from Paul and Barnabas, but... Elymas, the sorcerer, was standing right by and he recognized he was about to lose his convert. Now the Bible doesn't tell us what he did to oppose Paul and Barnabas. We just know obviously that Paul started getting what's called righteous indignation. You can see Paul blasted him. And many of us would think, wow, Paul, I mean, were you kind of skating on the edge there. Was that, you know, a sin that you blasted this man like this? But no, really the, the Greek kind of suggests that Paul, when it says he was filled with the Holy Ghost, it's almost like this sudden thing came over Paul. The Holy Spirit came on him and says, rebuke that man. Because God is looking at that soul and saying, no, I'm not letting this, this individual go. Paul, you must rebuke him openly so that this man can see the true power of Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. So Paul calls this man out as being subtle, as being full of mischief. It's interesting that he's called a child of the devil because earlier it says that his name in verse 6 was Bar-Jesus. What does that mean? The son of Jesus. Now, Jesus is a derivative of the Hebrew name Joshua or Jehoshua, which just simply means Jehovah saves or God is Savior. So it didn't necessarily mean that he was a, a son of Jesus Christ. You get that? But it's just interesting that what his name was. And it could have been that Paul was playing on that name because he says, okay, your name is son of Jesus, but you are a son of the devil. What's also interesting, because as we've been looking at that book of Acts, you know we kind of start in the text, and then we look around in our modern context, and we try to see what can we learn from Acts that is similar to modern day. And because I don't have a lot of time with this, I'll go right to the point. And we've talked about some of this before. And that is that just like you see right here in Acts chapter 13, this battle between Christianity and spiritualism, in our day, we see very clearly throughout Scripture that the end of times will be a huge battle between not necessarily Christianity and atheism, but Christianity and spiritualism, which is simply the, the working, the manifestation of the teachings of demonic spirits and their desire to actually convert the world to a different order of Christianity. Because what's happening in our day, which is different than back then, is that before the New Age and spiritualism would stand in opposition to God. 
But sometime around the 1800s, you remember the sermon that we did where I talked about Helena Blavatsky and Alice Bailey and some of these, uh, you know, occultists from the past? What they began to do is instead of directly opposing Christianity, they begin to take the Christian terms. They begin to take the Christian heroes and pretend that these individuals are in alignment with their New Age philosophies. So that now you see this blending of Christianity and the New Age, Christianity and spiritualism, until you can barely discern the difference between the two. Now I'll show you just a few things happening, but I'll read a few quotes to you that I think will be very eye-opening about what's going on in our days and times. So this is, a, this is a good quote, so I need you to listen to this one. It's a good size two paragraphs, two or three paragraphs. This comes from the great con- book, Great Controversy. And it says, as spiritualism more closely imitates the nominal Christianity of the day, it has greater power to deceive and ensnare or to trap people. Satan himself, listen to this, Satan himself is converted after the modern order of things. He will appear in the character of an angel of light Through the agency of spiritualism, miracles will be wrought or worked, the sick will be healed, and many undeniable wonders will be performed. And as the spirits will profess faith in the Bible and manifest respect for the institutions of the church, their work will be accepted as a manifestation of divine power. You remember when I talked to you about those occultists and we talked last year about the fact that there's a, the Bible, you know, mentions in 2 Thessalonians, there's an individual that is coming on the scene that eventually will manifest himself as if he is God on earth. He will be using the power of spirits to do this. Revelation 16 points this out. Revelation 13 makes it clear. The books of 1 and 2 John talk about that antichrist that will come upon the scene, and it will not be someone that appears to directly oppose Christ because they're using his name. The point is to try to deceive people into accepting a false Jesus through spiritualism. To use Christian terminology, the Christian Bible, a supposed respect for the institution of the church, all the while seeking to take it over and ultimately graft it directly into Satan's own philosophies. Yes, Lisa. Page 588. That was paragraph two. Thank you for raising your hand in class. (laughs) It goes on. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. And this is one reason why spiritualism is so successful, because of this one statement. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is hardly distinguishable. Which means when you're looking at people, you can hardly tell whether or not they are Christian or whether or not they're in the world. And part of that is because Christianity, in some ways, has attempted to try to convert the world by becoming like the world which always converts the church to the world and not the world to the church. Nowhere in the scripture do we ever see the apostles compromising their beliefs or their faith or becoming like, exactly like, the nations or the philosophies around them in order to convert. The last time that was tried in the Old Testament was when Israel did that. Did they convert anyone to their their side? No, they were converted to the heathens, and then what happened? They ended up in Babylon in captivity. Because they blended with the world and it was hardly, you were hardly able to distinguish between a Jew and the other nations around them. God called them to be separate and distinct for a purpose and for a reason so eventually the world would see them and either and both hate them but eventually want to be more like them. And God calls us to the same. Going on. Church members, don't be one of these church members. It says church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them. And Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. So again, this is the purpose and the goal of today. That's why, you know, you see back even in the 80s when I would be watching, you know, daytime television, you remember Bewitched? You remember some of these really early shows coming out? And now you have shows that are blatantly spiritualistic. I mean, we have you know, shared before that the second most sold, or not necessarily even published, sold book in the world is Harry Potter, the whole series. And of course, the number one is the Bible. The two greatest books that have ever been written, in a sense, 
is this competition between Christianity and spiritualism. And most people would know that Harry Potter is not Christian, but it's very interesting what was happening. Even when, remember the Lord of the Rings, when that came out, which has a lot of spiritual overtones, and a lot of these movies that come out that have this battle between good and evil, and what people try to do, especially Christians, and I think is just a way to justify actually enjoying these movies, is they try to see what lesson can we draw about Jesus from these movies. And I did the same thing, because I loved The Lord of the Rings. Anyone remember that series? Yeah, that was the last movie I saw until the Lord was like, get yourself out of there. Because it's not only introducing you to this battle between good and evil, you want that, read the Bible. (laughs) But what it also was doing is introducing you to the philosophies of spiritualism and its attractiveness. Going on. So Satan determines to unite them into one body, sweep everyone into spiritualism. Papists, who boast miracles of a, of, as a certain sign of the true church, will readily be deceived by this wonder-working power. Protestants, we're Protestants, we're birthed out of the Protestant Reformation. Having cast away the shield of truth. What is the shield of truth? It's the scriptures. It's the Bible the truth about Jesus, but it goes deeper than that. It's all the truths contained in Scripture. Protestants, when they start casting away the shield of truth and turning from Scripture, they will also be deluded. So now the papists, Protestants, and worldlings will all alike accept the form of godliness without the power. Isn't that what Paul said is going to happen in our world? People will have all these ungodly characteristics, and yet they will have a form, an outer shell of Christianity, while they're denying the power of Christianity, the power of a changed life, and more importantly, the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's possible to look Christian and seem Christian, and for someone even to think that they're Christian, while they don't have any power of Christianity whatsoever in their lives. They will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. So it says that Protestants, Catholics, and all worldlings, that includes everyone from every other religion and even the irreligious, are all being swept into spiritualism in this one grand union that ultimately will convert the world and usher in this millennium. And they believe that when the millennium comes, that here comes Jesus who will show up and walk this earth and work miracles and speak to people when the Bible already made it very clear when Jesus comes, he's coming to basically render judgment. He's He's rapturing those who have believed in him, but it's not a secret thing. We recognize when Jesus comes, it's audible, it's visible, it's powerful. Jesus has no reason to be secret about anything. When he came as a baby, it was a secret only because the church was not ready for him. But when he comes as a conquering king, folks are going to know about it. The Bible says every eye is going to what? See him. But also when he comes, he's not ushering in a millennium of peace on earth. Because we see very clearly when he comes, destruction of the earth will take place. Minutes more to say about that. I'm debating on reading this other paragraph now or later. I'll read it now, in case I don't come back to it later. Even in its present form, talking about spiritualism, so far from being more worthy of toleration than formerly, it is really more dangerous because of more subtle deception. While it it formally denounced Christ in the Bible, it now professes to accept both. But the Bible is interpreted in a manner that is pleasing to the unrenewed heart, while its solemn and vital truths are made of no effect. So it claims to receive the Bible, but it just guts it of all of its truth. And it's amenable to those who have unrenewed hearts. Because if you don't want to change and don't want to be convicted, you just change a couple of things in Scripture, and you can accept all the good things. And you can deny and reject all the things that will convict the carnal heart. Love is dwelt upon as a chief attribute of God, but it's degraded and weak into a weak sentimentalism, making little distinction between good and evil. God's justice 
his denunciations of sin, the requirements of his holy law are all kept out of sight. The people are taught to regard the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments as a dead letter. Pleasing, bewitching fables captivate the senses and lead men to reject the Bible as the foundation of their faith. Christ is as verily denied just like as before, but Satan has so blinded the eyes of people that the deception is not even discerned. We're already told in Scripture, I think it's 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, where it says that, you know, in the last days many will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Revelation chapter 16 makes it very clear that these spirits are going out unto the kings of the earth and unto all that are in the world to gather them together for the great day of God Almighty, Armageddon. So there's a gathering taking place. There is a, 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 a movement taking place, and it's very hard to discern it and to understand where it's coming from and where it's going. And again, because I don't plan on you know, making this a seminar this morning, I encourage you to take a look at a few things that I'll mention and as I mentioned them, we have books in our own library and videos in our own library about it. I encourage you to take a look at it. So you maybe have heard within Adventist circles and even within Christian circles talk about, you know, such practices that are coming into the church. How many of you guys have heard of the, the terminology spiritual formation? You've heard people mention that, okay? And you've heard that it's, you know, something that our some of our universities practice. Obviously, other Protestant universities practice it. How many of you have heard of this, the term, you know, uh, contemplative prayer and meditation, okay, things like that, that people use as buzzwords uh, for things that are even threatening within Adventist churches. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what these things mean, and I'll give you, I'm not going to give you a bunch of quotes and a lot of research. You need to do this on your own, because what I realize more and more is that uh, we have a theology in our own minds of how we think about God and how we see God. And we can come to church and listen to a minister, we can go online and listen to a presentation, and we can hear all this information and all these facts and all these quotes, and we can even believe those things and accept them and adopt them and say, so-and-so said this. But what I find is that many times people depend upon the words of other people without actually researching for themselves. So instead of depending on me to do the research, now I may compile some information, maybe one day after church we'll you know, do something on this, but for now I don't have a lot of information you know, to give you because I'm still researching some of this for myself. But when you look at contemplative prayer and spiritual formation and, and some of these concerns about mysticism and spiritualism coming into the church, what we're really looking at in my humble opinion, and in the research that I have done, is something that is very real. Because the Bible says it's real, and it's going to happen, and that there are segments of our church and people within those churches that do promote these things. You can go on the website for Andrews University, and, it's, and they have a, a segment on there about why they changed one of their classes to another name, and they used to call it Spiritual Formation. Now, I have a friend that went to Andrews University, and I asked about it. I said, you know, I hear all this stuff about, you know, the university and people practicing spiritual formation and these disciplines and meditation and contemplative prayer, basically Eastern, you know, religion, Hinduism, Buddhism. And he said, man, I, I didn't get any of that. It was one of the best classes I took. La Sierra, on their website, they have, you know, on their divin website of their divinity school, on the left-hand side, it talks about spiritual formation and what that class means. And so, because I've been taking some classes through one of our universities, what I began to realize is that this terminology is not coming from within Adventism, it's coming from other areas. And because folks are studying theologians and, and the works of other people who are not necessarily a part of our church, that buzzword comes down into our universities through individuals who are studying the works of other people and somehow landed within our church. But I've not found any evidence personally that I know of anyone directly practicing those. I'm not saying there isn't anyone, but when you hear about that happening in our church, a lot of times it's the buzzword without necessarily teaching the practices of Eastern mysticism. But maybe you have a different research, some different research on that. But from what I have seen, the words are coming down, but again, the problem is 
As I mentioned before, is that Christianity and spiritualism, Satan's goal is to mix them so much where you can't really tell the difference. So even if we start using the terminology without using the content, it can trip people up because now it makes it seem as if that's okay. When you hear it in another circle, you really don't have a barrier towards that. Some of the research I found, and again, I don't have a lot of things to show you online. I'll show you a few things in just a moment. What I found ultimately is a lot of this centers back to uh, Loyola, Ignatius Loyola. Everyone knows who he is. Okay, what did he found? What did he start? Okay, so he was the one who started the Jesuit order. And if you go onto the Jesuit webpage, you can see that the contemplative spirituality, the meditative life, the faith formation, a lot of that came directly from the faith life of that Jesuit. The centering prayer, the clearing of your mind. Now, New Agers and Buddhists and Hindus have been doing that for a long time. But this is a way in which it started kind of coming into formal Christianity. And again, I'd encourage you to research that on your own too. But there is something happening within Christianity. I'll read you another quote here talking about revival. True ones and false ones. So in the chapter in Great Controversy where it talks about revivals, it says this, and I'm just trying to pare some of this down. So it says, but many revivals of modern times have presented a marked contrast to those manifestations of divine grace, which in their earlier days followed the labors of God's servants. So she's comparing true revivals with false revivals. And the true ones, they worked reformation of the heart. People were transformed. They went right back to their Bibles. They follow God with a renewed heart, a renewed interest, with excitement. But about false revivals, it is true that a widespread interest is kindled. Many profess conversion. There are large accessions to the churches. Nevertheless, the result are not such as to warrant belief that there has been a corresponding increase in real spiritual life. So a revival takes place. There's a lot of much to do about something, but there's no real indication that there's an increase of spiritual life. She says the light which flames up for a time soon dies out, leaving the darkness more dense than before. Notwithstanding the widespread declension of faith and piety, there are true followers of Christ in these churches. Now it says, before the final visitation of God's judgments upon the earth, there will be among the people of the Lord such a revival of primitive godliness as has not been witnessed since apostolic times. What that says is that there is going to be a powerful revival among God's people of primitive godliness. Now that doesn't mean like walking around like cavemen, you know. Primitive is going back to the, the apostles, and the way they worshiped, and the way they lived, and the way they served God in its primitive and most simple form. Christ-likeness, power, strength, distinction from the world. There is going to be a revival of such among those who truly follow Jesus. Amen? Amen? I hope you want to be a part of that. It says, the spirit and power will be poured out upon his children. But at that time, many will separate themselves from those churches in which the love of this world has supplanted love for God and his word. Many, both of ministers and people, will gladly accept those great truths which God has caused to be proclaimed at this time to prepare a people for the Lord's second coming. The enemy of souls desires to hinder this work. Remember, Paul is preaching and Barnabas is preaching and that sorcerer opposed their work says the enemy of souls will try to hinder the work and before the time for such a movement will come, before the time. So the false revival is going to happen before the true. He will endeavor to prevent it by introducing a counterfeit revival. In those churches which he can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. Multitudes will exalt that God is working marvelously for them. When the work is that of another spirit under religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. Now I want to show you a few things that are interesting What are they? Interesting. Now, I'm not saying that what I'm going to show you right now is 
the manifestation of these great revivals that are talked about and prophesied there, where all Christians will be coming together under the guise of another spirit. But it's just interesting stuff. I came across this. You can see that very clearly. Good. So this is a, a movement that is actually happening next month. And in principle, I like it. What it's saying is, be one of a million standing for Jesus on 7-16-16. You can say that you're going. A number of great artists and, and speakers are going to be there. Maybe I can... There we go. A number of great artists and speakers will be there. Encouraging people to come to D.C. D.C. prepares, needs to prepare for you. Invite people. Pray together. Lifting a unified sound. It says, moments of historic change are often marked by historic gatherings. Together 2016 is the day our generation will meet on the National Mall to come together around Jesus and unified prayer, worship, and a call for catalytic change. We're coming together with as many people as possible who believe Jesus changes everything. Does Jesus change everything? Does he? Yes. Now, you can only testify to that if he has changed you. Amen? So, amen to the three <laughs> who said, yes, Jesus changes everything. Now, in the core of this, and you can, you, know, you can go on this website yourself and take a look at some of the folks who are invited, some musicians that maybe you hear regularly on the radio, some well-known you know, presenters and speakers. And at the core of this, I like it. Why? Because they're bringing folks together for worship, for prayer. How can you really, on the surface, oppose any of that? Are we not gathered together here for worship and for prayer? And you start gathering a lot of Christians together around the world uh, to come to Washington, D.C. I really don't have a problem with that. Here's another part of the website that you can go to. And it's talking about reset, a prayer to bring hope. And it's basically encouraging people to pray that Jesus will reset their lives, reset their school, reset their community, do something different, change and transform the order of things. You can go online and see what people are praying for. And then they have the section called Why Jesus. Jesus changes everything. He offers life, hope, and the ultimate reset. He lived a life that we couldn't and then died the death we deserve, and he is alive. Jesus welcomes you to come just as you are, no matter what you are dealing with. It could be instant or over the course of your life, but Jesus offers you a fresh start. All true, amen? You're invited to come together for a historic gathering where the only agenda is who? Jesus. And there's more. Now, as I was researching that, I came across that, I came across another interesting website. The Gathering, a national solemn assembly. So you see these large assemblies and gatherings of Christians. This particular website here, and I think the other one too, they say basically there, you know, there's no main organization. It's just Christian leaders coming together to, to pull folks together to pray and to basically change. And this one especially about the National Assembly, which is usually called in the Old Testament when things were going really wrong. They said we need to call everyone together and start praying and fasting and doing something. I think we can all recognize that our nation needs a lot of prayer, amen? Especially come November, I think. <laughs> Could win a lot of prayer. But this will be taking place in Dallas. You can see some of the, you know, the leaders there. and One vision, one voice, one agenda under God. And it's interesting that both of these major movements, and I don't know how connected they are, not some of the same leaders in, that will be at Reset, will be at this one. Some are different. At the end of the day... It's interesting that both are pointing out and saying, we just want to come together. Jesus is the agenda. Jesus is the watchword. We're doing this for Christ. And yet at the same time, we recognize within the Protestant world, as the Bible points out and as those quotes were pointing out, just the denial of sometimes the scriptures, a rejection of the Ten Commandments, an unwillingness to follow everything that God has called us to follow. And the reason why I'm showing you this, this is more like a commercial in a sense just to whet your appetite to study and to help you understand that there are things going on in our world while we are supposed to be reaching people for Jesus 
While we are supposed to be spreading the gospel to the entire world, there is another gospel, a desire to convert the world to another order of things. And how these movements play a part, I have no idea. I will not cast judgment on whether or not they are good or bad, but I will say that there are some of those leaders on there that I've witnessed before and researched before, and I didn't show you all of them, and I'm not going to show you really any of them. I'm not going to put anyone on blast today except for this one person, and I don't know a l too much about them, but I'll show you, tell you what I do know about them. One of the ladies that's especially going to be at the gathering she starred in a very well-known movie, Christian movie that came out recently, which we have in our library, and I watched it, and it's super inspirational. And if someone asked me, should I watch it? I, at this point, I would say, you know what? It's very powerful. I've already encouraged some of you to watch it, and that's The War Room. How many of you guys have seen that movie? Okay, very powerful movie on prayer. And I didn't see anything necessarily incorrect about that. So one of the ladies in there, her name is Pamela Shear, she is the star, one of the stars in that movie, and even though it does not come out in the movie itself, if you do research on her and what she believes and what she thinks, she basically, in a sense, and her and one other lady in the movie, they do kind of actively promote that contemplative prayer and meditation and things like that. Now, you're not going to get that in the movie, but once you're caught up into the movie, you start getting into some of the people who are in it or some of the major leaders in Christianity, you start to find that they have some funny beliefs. And so I bring that out only to simply say, this, there is something happening. And we must be aware of the movements that are taking place in this world to ultimately merge Christianity with spiritualism. Because when it takes place, you must know where you stand. You must know that you are not rejecting the authority and the testimony of Scripture. That you have not now allowed your life to conform to the world so that there's no distinction between you and those who do not believe in Jesus. Let's turn actually to John chapter 14, and we're going to pretty much bring this to a close. I have a little bit more to share with you, but I want to close with this. And as you're turning there, I know some of you are thinking that, why don't you talk about uh, another buzzword, especially within Adventism, which is an organization that's gaining a lot of popularity called the One Project. You guys have heard about that also, okay, some of you. And when I first saw the information about this and their basic whole agenda was saying Jesus all, Jesus period, all period. And I really believe that that movement probably was maybe, at least on the surface, born out of the fact that sometimes in churches, even within our own, you know, uh, church at large, you can become so caught up into the doctrines and so caught up into uh, the tenets and so caught up into behavior modification that you lose sight of Jesus. Anyone been there? Yeah. And when that happens, it leaves the soul hungry for an experience with Christ. Because you can have all the intellectual knowledge you want, but if we don't have Jesus abiding in the heart and the experience of Christ living within us, then it leaves a gaping hole and we have this soul hunger. And the reality is, is when we're, when, everyone ever been really hungry? Where you saw something in the refrigerator or something on the road and you're driving and saying, I'm so hungry, I would eat that. And on any other given day, you know full well you would not eat that. It's interesting, you read, I read about like the Donner Party and they were you know, starving, they were traveling you know, throughout you know, areas of Nevada and I believe uh, the, that Oregon Trail. And the Donner Party, they started losing folks to, you know, this harsh winter. And I, I remember reading an excerpt from a uh, biography about some of them. And some of them reached the point where they were obviously eating each other. Now, not necessarily be the, the lie. They wouldn't jump on each other and start eating a live person. But folks would die. And they were so hungry, they would resort to cannibalism. And there was one story where a man, they were hunting some deer and they finally found this deer. They were able to make some kind of a spear or a bow and arrow, and he killed the deer and ran upon it. And while the deer's blood was still gushing out, instead of just waiting to you know, cut the animal up, literally started drinking the blood of this deer. Now, on any other regular given day, nobody in their right mind would run upon a deer, cut the jugular vein, and drink the blood. But because they were so hungry, they would do something so that, that drastic just to fill the need. You remember the story of Jonathan when they were, you know, fighting and his, his father said, no man until we finish killing the Philistines, no man eat anything all day long. You're in the midst of a war and he says, don't eat. 
just, you know, not thinking. <laughs> They're walking along in the woods, and Jonathan, Saul's son, seeing some honey because the bees would, you know, create these hives within trees, and they said there was honey all over the ground. And Jonathan puts, you know, the tip of his rod inside of the honey, puts it to his mouth, and it says his eyes just lightened up. You know, have you ever been so famished, you eat something, it's like you just had a new life? <laughs> And everyone said, look, your dad said, don't eat anything. And he says, look, my dad's a nutcase, is essentially what he said. The scripture says it differently, but that's my paraphrase. He says, look, guys, we need to eat. The guys were so hungry that they went to the cattle and the sheep, and they started killing them. And Jews don't, are not supposed to eat, and we are not supposed to eat meat that has the blood in it. Because that's the carrier of the disease. And all like that, there's other spiritual implications behind God telling us not to eat the blood. And so they start eating these animals, and they didn't drain the blood. It wasn't kosher. But they were so hungry, they did something they would not normally do on another given day. And I really believe that people today are so spiritually hungry, so famished for the word of God, so famished for an experience with Jesus, and sometimes they don't even know it. The folks are just looking for something spiritual to fill themselves with. And people will eat anything when they're hungry. We have a responsibility to this world and to people that you know in your neighborhood and your friends and your family to present to them the authenticity of Christianity and the real and the true Christ. To offer them an experience that will fill and satisfy the soul. And Jesus in John chapter 14, again I'm closing with this, he's talking to Thomas about and really the disciples about the fact that he's getting ready to go to heaven, prepare a place for them. And Jesus says in John chapter 14 and verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. In verse 9, Jesus talks to them and says, let's see, the Philip, have I been so long time with you and yet you have not known me? And again, I've cut down the sermon a little bit. And so I want to bridge these points of our need to reach Christians, or re reach the world, the unreached, including other Christians. And yet, we can't really preach to people and teach to people and reach folks out there if we ourselves don't know Jesus. Now, that seems like it's a... That's, that's, that seems like it goes without saying. But the reality is that we must know the true Christ. The other implication is if we do not, and our soul is hungry and unfilled, we eventually, because of the pressure that spiritualism is going to put on the world and because of the unrenewed and unregenerated heart that can only be transformed by the power of Jesus, and we've not experienced him, we will have no power to resist the conversion of the world that's coming by the other power. Because it says, Protestants who've cast away the shield of truth, they have no power to resist. It is imperative that you have an experience with Christ. That you know him as the way, the only exclusive way to the Father. You know him as the truth, as the Bible presents Jesus as truth, and as the life, the power of true spiritual life. And if Jesus has not become the way for you and the truth for you and the life in you, then my appeal is that you take an inventory and make sure today before you leave that you have Jesus living inside of your heart. And that you are not converted after the worldly order of things. Because the longer I pastor and the longer I live, the more I realize, and I look at my own life as well, the more I realize that people are battling and struggling to hold on to their faith. And sometimes I think I, I guess I, I like to think that everybody I preach to and speak to and inter engage with are absolute, wonderful, you know, God-fearing, keep the commandments straight up by the power of the Holy Spirit Christians. Now, I realize that I have a battle. I have a soul that needs to be won. I know what my weaknesses are. I know where I, where I need to come up on higher ground for Jesus. But I usually try to give credit to people and say, you know what, everyone I see here today, I believe is really walking strong and powerful with Jesus. 
And the more I connect with people and minister to folks, I realize, man, we are sometimes really missing that power experience. Reaching after it, hungry for something, but in need of something greater and something more. So I just want to ask this morning, if there's anyone here, young or old, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, the Holy Spirit is calling you, and you're saying, you know what, I need that deeper experience with Jesus, not just to avoid being swept away by the things that are coming on this world very soon, but just so that you can truly in your heart know the power of the God that loves you and that died for you. Yeah. And that you want to commit, not just for today, not just for a moment, not just until the sermon kind of fades away, but you want to commit your life to knowing Jesus, the way, the truth, the life. That you want to take time to study for yourself. That's why I just threw a bunch of information at you, is because I said, you know what? I'll give you enough to start thinking and start studying, but you go and experience Jesus and the power of his word. And also that you'll commit to saying, you know what? I have a responsibility to people around me to share with them Jesus. Because if you don't get to them, the other power will. And it will not just present to them a false Christ. It is possible that people around us will die searching for truth, hungering for it, and they will accept Satan as Jesus. And you had an opportunity to tell them otherwise. So I want to pray. And you can pray for, also pray yourself and Ask for what the Holy Spirit wants you to pray about. This might be a time to pray and say, Lord, I don't know if I really know you. Or I've been so caught up on the intellectual side of my relationship that my heart and my soul are not filled. And it's a time to ask for Jesus to give you a filling, F-I-L-L-I-N-G, not just a F-E-E-L-I-N-G, feeling. Maybe it's a time to say, you know what, Lord, I'm afraid to talk to people about Jesus. I don't, I don't have that ability and say, Jesus, give me your power to help reach people while the world is being, are, is being converted to other things. Amen. And maybe the Lord is calling you to something else. And so I'll give you a few moments to just talk to the Savior. And then I'll close this with prayer. Lord, we thank you for hearing our prayers as your people are praying to you now and calling upon your name. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us that authentic experience with Jesus. I pray that as we are watching things happening within the Christian world that we don't fully understand, we can't fully comprehend questions about spiritualism and mysticism in our own ranks, Lord God, outside of what's happening beyond us, there is a deep concern that we ourselves are in Christ. That we've accepted Jesus as Lord and personal Savior, that we have fallen at the foot of the cross, we've allowed our sins to be washed away, we've allowed the power of Christ to dwell in us, that we've gone beyond the form of godliness to allow the image of godliness to be perfected in us through the power of the Spirit. And Lord God, I pray that each one here would have that experience with you, even our young people. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us power to be witnesses for you. We can't urge enough, Lord God, and you can't urge upon us enough how important it is that we help people to find the true Jesus and not the false one. Lord God, help us not to be swept away into the world because we know there's a, there's a massive movement, movement for the conversion of the world. Help us to be firm and, and set, Lord God. Help us to minimize distractions in our lives that are keeping us from seeking after Jesus, 
fulfill the, the need within our souls, Lord God, for spiritual things. And I thank you, Father, for hearing and answering these prayers because we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's close by singing our maybe one stanza.